Now I have the great pleasure to introduce one of the very active member of Tamta University, Dr. Islam El Hawari. She is going to uh, present challenges in hematopoietic stem cell for uh, thalassemia. Tamta University experience. Okay, thank you, Dr. Adaila. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amal, for the generous invitation. Uh, I know we had uh, a large dose of scientific talks. Uh, we are all tired and we are uh, just before the break. I'm going to make it short. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, bone marrow transplantation for thalassemic patients from the point of view of Tom's experience and what we have been through. But before, uh, allow me to introduce the unit for you. We have been working for three years. Uh, we have uh, four GMP rooms, uh, all equipped with positive pressure and HEPA filters. We have also a stem cell lab, uh, a GMP facility that's one of the most important GMP facilities in Egypt. Uh, we have been working since three years. We have transplanted 35 patients. We are a conjoint unit. We have an adult team and pediatric team. Adults transplanted about 13 cases and we have transplanted about 22 children. 15 of them were thalassemia. This makes a great bulk of disease, of, of the disease ratio in transplantation. Uh, the other cases are between aplastic anemia, mucopolysaccharidosis. We just transplanted one case of autologous. It was uh, Hodgkin lymphoma in CR2. Uh, so we have uh, a little bit of experience in thalassemia bone marrow transplantation. Uh, thalassemia started the, uh, as a disease targeted for transplantation in the 80s of the last century. In a small town in Italy called Pizarro, we are going to have this name again and again. In Pizarro, they uh, made a group, a consensus, uh, to transplant thalassemic patients. They transplanted about 1,000 thalassemic patients under the age of 17, and they published the results. And that was fascinating that the outcome of thalassemia-free survival was up to 73%. Of course, they, all the donors were matched sibling donors. Since then, Allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for matched sibling donors became an option. And when we have options, we are always confused. Which one is better and which one is going to give us more convenient life choices and which one is going to give us more and more complications. In the horizon, there is genetic therapy. We hope it works. It's going to solve lots of issues. Now we are being served a little bit with uh, hemoglobin F inducers but lifelong transfusion and iron nucleation are the mainstay for treatment for thalassemia. And it is a well-established therapy with higher experience that offers the patient good choices for life. But still, it's not curative. Still, all the time, our patients feel as if they are tied to the bag of blood. They are tied for life. The only option to unleash them, to untie them, is to give them bone marrow transplantation for now, waiting for the gene therapy later on. Our agenda today be to talk about the challenge. We are going to talk about conditioning, uh, uh, GVHD prophylaxis. We are going to talk about morbidities and regimen-related toxicities and post-transplant outcome. But first, let's start to talk about the patient characteristics. What are the characteristics of our patients? As we said, we have transplanted 15 thalassemic patients. The youngest were one year and 10 months two cases, and the oldest is present right now in the unit. He's 11 years old. The age range between uh, the highest number of cases was four cases about five years old, but the real challenge was in transplanting those two older children. We are going to talk about them later on. The mean age was 4.5, 11 males and four females. See on 13 at time of admission, the median was 1,400 they were positive for PCR for hepatitis C. In 12 patients, only three patients were negative, and we evaluated our patients with fibro scan for liver fibrosis. Four patients were F0, and those are the younger patients. Eight patients were F1, and the three patients had F2. We didn't transplant F3. We did that to classify our patients to determine does it force the trouble does it force the risk to go for bone marrow transplantation? Bizarre put a classification depending on three main items. The size of the liver, two centimeters below the coastal margin, the presence of regularity of chelation, and of course, liver fibrosis. 
They evaluated the tooth liver biopsy, but liver biopsy is an invasive procedure. We are replacing it either with MRI to tooth star or the FIPO scan. To say that, or to answer the question of the parents, is my, patient, is my child is going to live a good life? Is he going to survive this procedure? To answer this question, we are going to say, the lower the bizarre class, class one, is going to give us the best results as regards disease-free survival and overall survival. And bizarre three is going to give us the worst results. We have to be clear about that with every single patient we are going to transplant. We are not talking about the high risk group, which is beyond seven years. This is a subclass of class three. It needs different protocols and different regimens for transplantation. We have transplanted the majority of our cases. Seven cases were bizarre two. Two cases were bizarre one and bizarre one to two. Four, three cases were bizarre two to three, and just one case was bizarre three, and we are going to have a special emphasis on the protocol used for this patient. All our patients went through thorough evaluation before transplantation. For the donor, as Dr. Khaled said, he's, uh, actually he's forced to donate uh, by different means. One of the means is convincing him to donate. And for the patient, with a special emphasis on the multiple organ damage, especially echocardiography, liver function, renal function, the general performance status of the patient, not every indicated patient is eligible. The indication says any patient with thalassemia who has a matched sibling donor and he is transfusion dependent is indicated, but not everyone is eligible to go for transplantation. Of course, all the patients had a matched sibling donor, that's why we go only for matched sibling donor transplantation. We harvested bone marrow in two cases. The rest of cases went for preferred blood harvest, preferred stem cell harvest, sorry. Although the literature say that bone marrow harvest is more beneficial for those receiving a transplantation for benign conditions, they have less incidence of GVHD acute and chronic, but we went for preferred stem cell for other reasons. Forget about the literatures. We went for preferred stem cell because of the donor, because the parents refused to put the donor into the OR, because the donor, the, the parents refused to uh, do a surgery. They think of bone marrow harvest as a surgery. Besides the cost of the bone marrow collection bag and its availability, of course, so we went for preferred stem cell harvest in most of our cases. We were targeting a CD34 positive count of 3 to 8 multiplied to 10 by the power of 6, Berkey G in preferred harvest, and in bone marrow harvest, the target was the total nucleated cell count from 2 to 3 multiplied to 10 to the power of 8. We selected the conditioning regimen and the GVHD prophylaxis for our patients. We put in consideration general headlines. The headlines say that uh, a MAC conditioning without irradiation is a rule. Maximum intensity conditioning. A pupil regimen is a rule. And we can make an exception to bizarro for cases with bizarro class 3. We went for most of our patients with PUSI ATG using a PUSI fan dose. If the patient is younger than 7 years, we use 20 milligrams. If he's older than 7 years, we use 16 milligrams. Cyclophosphamide not using the 200 milligrams as uh, the adults, but using just 120. ATG, the earlier transplanted cases were transplanted at a dose of 100 milligrams per kg. Nowadays, we are transplanting just for 30 milligrams per kg. The higher pusel fan, the higher pusel uh, gives the such therapeutic range that has given adults uh, the lower cyclophosphamide for less side effects, and adding, adding ATG to the regimen is really helpful, especially in patients who went through multiple transfusion, exceeding 10 transfusion in a lifetime. Of course, all patients above two years have exceeded 10 transfusion in a lifetime. And also, it helps us to decrease the number of T cells, especially we collected preferred stem cells, not tomorrow. The exceptional regimen here was that for bizarre class three and the high risk group. One case took that regimen, which included the introduction of hydroxyurea for three months before transplantation and adding philodorabin to the regimen. So collectively, we transplanted most of our patients using PUSI-ETG, 
just one patient using flu pucci ATG and the two young patients, you remember them, who had who were aged one year and ten months, they were transplanted only with pucci, not needing ETG because they were transfused less than ten times in their lifetimes. As regards to HD prophylaxis, the standard for a long time in thalassemia was steroids and CSA. They were extremely afraid of using mesotrexate with a liver condition and thalassemic child. But now we are back to mesotrexate. We are using mesotrexate and CSA nowadays. This makes one third of our cases. We have added it to all cases, bizarro one and two. It's removed from bizarro three only. As you call the morbidity and regimen related toxicity. We are taking a patient who is living a, a satisfactory life into a very challenging, life-changing experience. We always say that if the patient gets outside the cabinet or, or, or the room of bone marrow transplantation, he's going to make it later on. Lots of challenges faces. The first is infection. We are putting the patient in an intended immune-compromised condition. Lots of infection phases. The most severe and most life-threatening were central castor-related infection, fungal infection of the lung, and we had one case of septic shock. That patient went through mechanical ventilation for three days with enotropic support, and we were lucky enough that patient survived. He was one of the cases aged two years old. Acute GVHD in our cases was not that common. Nine patients went through the condition without having any acute GVHD. Two cases had a skin affection only, three cases with skin and GRT, and one case with a skin and liver acute GVHD. Chronic GVHD, we are still lucky. We have just a few cases, just the three cases, having very few hyperpigmented areas. I hope that remains like that. We are still in the first three years. Uh, I think we are very lucky to have this instance of chronic GVHD. The worst nightmare during follow-up of our patient was that. That was surprising for our mentors from Nasser Institute too. We had press in 14 out of the 15 patients with T reversible encephalopathy syndrome, and this is a really high incidence. We had a patient who had press twice. We had a patient with complete loss of vision, and it was reversible. We searched about that and why our patients are getting depressed this frequently. We found that addition of fludarabine to the regimen is a risk factor. The presence of PUSI is another risk factor, although most of transplantation regimens are few paced. Hemorrhagic cystitis is another nightmare. 100% of our patients had hemorrhagic cystitis. And we were surprised to see hemorrhagic cystitis for the first time beyond the day plus 30. There is no metabolite of cyclophosphamide. There is nothing that would explain that except the viral infection, PK viral infection. SOS or hepatic sinusoidal syndrome, we are going against the odds of common. This is the most common complication in thalassemia, and we saw zero patients with SOS. We had no cases of sinusoidal occlusion syndrome. What served us very well is the presence of well-trained junior staff for critical care. Actually, I found out that bone marrow transplantation is not a transplantation business, it's a critical care unit. We have to pay attention for fluid and electrolyte imbalances. We have to be well-trained for mechanical ventilation to immediately rescue the patients if anything happened. We needed a TPN team for the two young children, we are mentioning them again, who were below the age of two years. They needed TPN by the end of the course of therapy because they went through severe mucositis and malnutrition and the recovery was delayed. The use of inotropic medication helped us a lot in many patients and that takes us what's after bone marrow transplantation. What are the post-transplant sequences? We considered the patient engrafted once reaching a neutrophil count of 500 per cubic millimeter, platelet count more than 20,000 and hematocrit value above 25%. We checked for chimeras. The easiest way for us was sex difference, and we were lucky to have the majority of our cases of different sex donation. But we resorted to VNTR in some cases, especially we are going to say that we had a case of graft failure that needed follow up frequently with VNTR. We just need to establish and make stable chimeras. 
We don't need to change the Maru type completely. It doesn't need to be 100% a stable chimerism that allow scabbing the repeated transfusion is going to be enough. Some of the latest factors that were not investigated in our cases because we, we don't have that luxury of time, but the patients were informed about it. Luckily, the secondary malignancies are not common post-transplantation thalassemia, but the issue that has to be addressed clearly is fertility issues. 60% are going to be infertile. With fertility issues and other some diagnoses, we have transplanted patients with aplastic anemia who are beyond the property. In these cases, we preserve the sperm and ova, but in this condition, most of our children are below seven years, and the oldest is 11 years, so the fertility issue must be clearly clarified. The follow-up visits after discharge from the unit is really important. We have a strict schedule. We tell the patient that the journey is not over yet. He has to follow up his medications at home, the GVHD prophylaxis, the antimicrobial, antiviral therapy, pneumocystis prophylaxis, and other supportive medications. And we have to remember, he got to be revaccinated. And another issue was that of the uh, calculation, both transplantation, which is a really important issue. This is the final results. We have 13 patients with thalassemia free survival. We have one patient of graft failure and one patient with mortality inside the BMT unit. To conclude, if you are going to transplant your patient, pick him as early as possible before multiple organ affection. And it is better to be in a unit with a pediatric team to follow up the other complication. Many thanks to the team of BMT unit and special thanks to my mentor, to Mohammed Shanshui. Thank you. And as I usually say, may all your dreams come true. And at last but not least, thanks to all our patients. This photo was taken with their permission. We were celebrating the anniversary, the third anniversary of the unit. Thank you to them and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Islam. You really give us a very good uh, idea about uh, stem cell transplantation thank in you. Tanta, computation for Tanta as well. It's very good, very good job a very good outcome for stem cell transplantation. Actually, you. you give us a very good hope for the young generation coming with, with more evolution. There is always hope. Of that wish. Yes, yes, yes. Starting by, with, the, with the elder one, Dr. Khalid Salama, which is a, one, a pioneer uh, in the issue of uh, stem cell transplantation. Actually, we uh, congratulate you all for this uh, great progress in stem cell transplantation uh, in Egypt, starting from real transplantation to core blood banking to having a very young kids for blood, uh, transplantation in Tanta and very good uh, follow-up. Is there any question for uh, the speak for this very interesting and very important speakers?